Is there enough, uh, or is there a limit to how concentrated a solution can be? Can you have an 800 molar solution? Think about that. The answer is no. Heck no. Okay, imagine I have one cup of water and I dissolve about three pounds of sugar, try to dissolve three pounds of sugar in one cup of water. Pounds of sugar, I'm, okay? Big sacks of sugar. The picture in your head. It won't work. It can't, okay? Because there is a limit to what's going on. There is some way you can cheat and make the concentration a little bit more concentrated than what it normally would be. There are three types of solutions. And if you will, think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, okay? If you don't remember that story, you got, uh, the, well, in summary, okay, you got three bears, a mama bear, a papa bear, and uh, a little bear, okay? Goldilocks comes in in the woods, she goes in the house, and, you know, she's like, there's three porridges sitting there. Obviously, the bears are not there. Um, otherwise, they doesn't eat her. Uh, but anyway, uh, the first bowl was too hot, the other one was too cold, and then the middle one was just right. Uh, then she got tired and wanted to take a nap, so she went in the bedroom. Uh, she found out the papa bear's bed was too hard, mama's bed was too soft, and uh, turns out the little tyke's little tiny baby bear's uh, bed was just right. So there's uh, three types here, and that's what we're comparing it to. Oh, she did the chair thing too, right? Yeah. So out of the three little stories here, we got three types of solutions. You can have something that is unsaturated, something that is saturated, and then something that is really overkill, super saturated. Okay, notice I didn't say them in order here. The first one we talk about, the most normal one, the average, is saturated which means it's at the point where you cannot dissolve any more solute. Uh, so there is that breaking point where you can add a little bit of sugar and then you're like, mm, it's not sweet enough, I can add a little bit more. And then you add a little bit more and you add a little bit more. And to the point where you start, it doesn't dissolve and all of a sudden you have sugar at the bottom of your glass. You know what I'm talking about? The best part. Yeah, you know, you put sugar on your cornflakes, right? No. I, don't even eat I did put it on my raisin bread. Though. Okay, well, you'll notice that the sugar didn't really all dissolve. Some of it will, but some of it will not because there is a breaking point of how much you can dissolve. Um, so saturated is that point where if you add a little bit more, it doesn't dissolve, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's at the maximum limit, okay? You add a full tank here. Uh, unsaturated means you can still add more, all right? You put, you're like, okay, this coffee's bitter. I'm going to add a little bit of sugar into it to make it a little sweet. Um, an unsaturated could mean no sugar in it at all, or very little. But until you get to this point, that's the breaking point. Turns out at the very, you can go overkill, which is super saturated, which is well, well over the limit. Now, the only way you can do this is by heating it up to, to force it to dissolve. So, I mean, if you, it makes sense. How do you make uh, something dissolve? Well, you heat it up. Uh, Try it at home. You can take uh, four cups of sugar and actually dissolve it in a half cup of water. It is possible. That's how you make caramel. Or one way you can make caramel. Caramel? Caramel. Caramel, whatever. Caramel. 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 I don't know. However you're supposed to say it. Nobody really knows. Paracel. Paracel? Shut up. Okay. <laughs> By the way, these are three good definitions you're obviously going to see on the test. Obviously, I could put a multiple choice question on this. Which one's saturated, supersaturated, unsaturated? So supersaturated solutions only occur under special conditions. Like I said, they're very unstable. So here's a picture for you, which uh, they say a picture says a thousand words. Unsaturated solution is basically where more solute can dissolve. You got a set number of volume here. You're just going to add a little bit more. This is kind of like unsweet tea, basically is the way I look at it. Some people like that. However, to the point where you make it to where you can dissolve the sugar, okay, where you cannot add any more sugar and, and it starts coming crusty at the bottom, that is a saturated solution. Now, I'd only say that is at that breaking point, okay? Then there is the point where you go overkill and you have the extreme sweet tea, which is super saturated. Mm. Note the concentration increases as you go across. Well, it makes sense. You're adding more solute every single time. There you go. Uh, but basically, this is the three ways to summarize it. Goldilocks and the three bears. This one's too soft. This one's too hard. This one's just right. Okay, this porridge is too cold. This porridge is too hot. This one's just right. It's just the, way, the same way of looking at it. So look at this. Supersaturated sodium uh, acetate. Now, I know it's warmed up a little bit, but now I want you all to think about, have you all ever seen these hand warmers? Oh, yeah, yeah. Not the charcoal ones, 
but they're liquid. And you crack this little thing on the inside, and they turn solid. And they release a lot of heat. Okay. No. Well, yeah, I think those are the uh, charcoal ones. Yeah, this stuff is liquid. But when you crack this little disc inside, it solidifies and it releases tons of heat. Uh, they're reusable. One reason why they work the way they do is because uh, it's an exothermic reaction. But there's only one chemical in there, and it's sodium acetate. Do you warm it up? Do you warm it up? Do you warm it up to reuse it, to remelt it? But this is what happens here. It's called a seed crystal. Now, you don't have to write any of this down. It's not going to be on the test, but I'm going to show you. This is what we call a supersaturated solution. It's overkill. It's overly done. But they heated it up to melt all the sodium acetate inside it. Well, they want to get into solid form. And if you remember that uh, video you saw where you can make the slushy with the Coke, yeah. it's kind of like that. Your Coke is like super saturated with uh, sugar and stuff inside, and it wants to freeze, um, except it just needs a little help getting there. And that's when you bring it to the freezing point. Well, this is a little bit different. It's very, very saturated to a point where it wants to be a solid. The only problem is everything's in a liquid phase. It doesn't have any kind of schematic to go on. It needs what is called one crystal to be dropped in to make it react. This is what it looks like. So this is a super saturated solution beforehand. If you drop one little seed crystal inside, this is a solid piece of sodium acetate. Here is the liquid form. You drop it in and immediately crystals form right before your eyes and it releases a lot of heat, and especially a lot enough to burn you. Uh, we're talking about like to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how hot it can get. Uh, but it's used on really cold times whenever you're at football games and things like that. But one reason why it reacts the way it does, this is in solid form, this is in liquid form. So imagine all of a sudden you got all these molecules just hanging around, they're not doing anything. And then all of a sudden a drill sergeant walks in and says, 10 hut. Well, imagine this is your drill sergeant. When you drop it in, it basically gives them the formation to go on or the schematic to go on to build crystals. And so what happens is the initially the first bit start and then the others start lining up in a line also until the whole glass is covered in crystals. Anyway, so how does a solution form? Well, ionic solutions, we talked about this last go way back in unit four. I'm telling you again. So when you put salt in water and you know salt is NaCl, right? Okay, well what happens is this, water surrounds it because water is both polar. It has a, the two hydrogens over here like to be attracted to that chlorine because it's negative and the uh, red oxygen part that you see here, they're negative. I mean, let's think about the charges here. You go back to your charges, plus one, plus two, yeah, 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 negative two, negative one, all that kind of stuff. Negative side, positive side, hydrogens over here on the positive side. Ooh. Uh, the oxygens are on the negative side. They're going to be attracted to the positive. Remember, opposites attract. But they do not bond. Okay? This is how salt dissolves in water. Sugar does this too, except there is a difference. One forms ions that you see before you. The other does not. Sugar does not form ions. They don't break down into charges. They just surround the bigger water, uh, sugar molecule and dissolve. So that's how things do dissolve. So this is what it looks like. Salt dissolved in water, and it looks like this. You got the little ions around here. Now let me ask you this. Why do you get electrocuted in water? Because the salt that's in you. That's it. The salt, whenever you get in water, I don't know if you realize this, when you sweat, your sweat tastes like salt. salt. Well, guess what? You're secreting salt also. How do you get electrocuted? There's only one thing up here that electrocutes you. Salt. The salt. But actually one part of the salt. The N. The N-A. That positive charge carries electricity. Water does not electrocute you. I'm going to say this again. Water does not electrocute you. It's the salt. Molecular solutes, aka covalent compounds, like sugar, do not separate into ions, like I told you a second ago. Ionic compounds do. Covalent compounds do not. Now, what makes up the difference between ionic and covalent? Let's go back to... <laughs> You're close. Okay, metal plus non-metal yeah. is going to be ionic. Yeah. Okay, which are these two. All right, molecular compounds or non-metals are non-metal, non-metal. Okay, which for example, sugar, which is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, that's those three, uh, they're all non-metals. They're going to be, they're going to dissolve in water, but they don't form ions. They don't carry a charge. They're not going to electrocute you. Anyway, so long story short. Two definitions you need to know, electrolyte versus non-electrolyte. Well, guess what? Electrolyte carries electricity. Non-electrolyte, 
does it? If a solution conducts electricity, it's an electrolyte. It makes sense. Strong electrolytes, believe it or not, one is definitely salt. Uh, hard water, magnesium chloride, uh, calcium chloride, those are another little bit of electrolytes. That's why you do get electrocuted in, uh, like if water's on the outside of the ground and you step into a puddle and an electric pole falls on it and you get electrocuted, that's why you get electrocuted. Also because you have a lot of salt in your body. Uh, another thing is acids. They're actually strong electrolytes too. This is going to be important next unit, the whole electrolyte thing. That's how we're able to actually measure concentration of acids. It's going to come back. You know, word I want you to note here, the word dissociate, okay, just means it breaks down. Notice here, here's a picture giving you a simulation. Both of these guys, uh, copper two chloride, they put it in solution, it breaks into two things, copper, chlorine. That's all those little ions are floating around the water. They put this little thing in here, two prongs. It's kind of like you licking the end of a, uh, that battery. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it zings you. One reason why you got salt on your tongue. Um, same thing here, the ions are in solution, it lights up the light bulb. If it doesn't light up, that means there's no charge. However, so what does it look like when we do it with sugar? Do not conduct electricity charge, they do not dissolve water. Ethanol, which is alcohol, it does not make ions in solution, okay? Therefore, it does not carry a charge. Sugar doesn't do this either. Uh, ethanol, and uh, does anybody know what ethylene glycol is? Yeah. It's something that's in your car. It's in your gas. Nope. Just... You're close. It's not in your gas tank. You're getting close. It's not in the battery. Antifreeze. That's right. So antifreeze is, does not form ions either, which is kind of good. No, solubility is how much can dissolve, not how much is dissolved. Okay? It's how much can be dissolved. Factors that affect solubility. Some of these you already kind of know. They're common sense. Think about it. Okay? First off, the nature of the solute and the solvent. Can oil dissolve in water? No. 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 So you cannot have a solution. Due to the polarity. Due to the polarity, which goes back to this saying right here. Like dissolves like. Polar can dissolve polar, which means sugar is a polar molecule. Uh, water is a polar molecule. They dissolve each other. Okay? Makes sense. Um, even though sugar, I mean, salt is actually ionic, which that technically means super polar. Uh, it really dissolves in water. That's one reason why you put salt in water. Um, however, oil can dissolve in other oils, depending on the type of oils that it is. But they're both nonpolar. They're going to dissolve each other. Uh, however, you try to mix the two together, water and oil, they don't mix. And that's one reason why you cannot have them together. So that is one factor that does affect solubility. Which one of these two is more likely to be dissolved in water? I'm thinking B6. Why do you think B6 would be more likely to dissolve in water than the other guy? Less molecules. That's it. Look at which one's bigger. <laughs> That's a lot of water needed to dissolve this versus this guy. Number two, we talked about last unit, the temperature. Depending on the temperature, uh, let's go right to our classic, how do you make sweet tea? Do you put sugar in cold tea to make it sweeter? No. You don't like to, right? What do we usually do to make sweet tea? Hot. You make it hot, you put the sugar in, then you ice it down. So here's the thing, why does your soda go flat in hot uh, temperature? Well, here's the reason why. It's hot. The CO2 is going to uh, is going to fall out of your drink quicker why than if it's cold. Flat? What? Why is it his flat? Because this is cold. Sure? And I don't know what's with the tweeter bird here. Pressure is another one that goes back to the last unit. Uh, you don't notice this because everything's under normal atmospheric pressure. But how do we force, you know, CO2 to get into a drink? Well, we can do the whole carbonic acid thing. Uh, but why do we serve co sodas cold? Well, that's the reason why. It keeps the CO2 in there longer. Factors that affect solubility in general. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Let's kick this up a notch. This is factors that affect solubility. Let's talk about the rate, which means speed. We want to make this joker dissolve fast. How do we make it dissolve fast? All right. Three things you could speed up your uh, sweet tea dissolving. Number one, crush up your sugar. Crush it up. Surface area. If you've got a big cube of sugar, you know a salt cube, not salt cube, sugar cube. If you put that in your coffee, it takes a while to dissolve because it's all clumped together. But if you have it powdered, which is broke down in very fine powder, it's going to dissolve quicker because there's less surface area. 
or I'm sorry, more surface area available so it will, like the water molecules will attack better. Uh, I'll show you a picture here in a second. How does this work is this. If you're going to attack, a lot of people want to attack a stronghold or something like that. It's kind of hard to attack everybody inside here because, well, they're all clumped together. It's kind of like watching that movie, the Spartan movie, which was not very historically accurate, but hey, it blew your mind. Um, but anyway, they all stood together in what is called a phalanx, all right, or a phalanx, whatever you want to call it. They all stood shoulder to shoulder. The enemy could not penetrate very well, but if they separated them, they were able to get in there and kill them all, okay, which eventually they did. Um, the moral of the story is, have backup. Um, <laughs> Number two is stirring, okay, so you can make your sh uh, sugar powdered up. Number two, stir it up. More friction. <laughs> And y'all do that. If you're dissolving sugar in uh, coffee or whatever, you stir it up. This is why. More collisions. Therefore, the more they're going to dissolve. The more they match up, the quicker they're going to get her done. So you got company coming over. You powdered up your sugar. You stirred it up, but it's still not dissolving. There's one more thing you can do to make it dissolve quicker. Put it in the fridge where? Other way around. Kind of put it in the microwave. So what does that happen when you put it in the microwave? Heat it up. You heat it up. So the third one is exactly like the first three we talked about. It's temperature. So in case you missed the stirring, it's break it down, stir it up, and heat it up. Well, you heat it up to dissolve it, and then you put it over ice. And that's why usually you serve tea hot. Because it keeps it dissolved, and then when you put it over ice, you know. Uh, colligative properties is one that depends on the concentration. I'm going to say this again. Concentration, not identity. I'm going to say this one more time. Depends on the concentration, not the identity. Three molars sucrose and three molars of ethanol. Two different compounds, right? Guess what? They're going to have the same effect on the properties of a solution. And what do I mean by the properties? I'm going to talk about the, uh, well, I'll show you here in a second. There are four colligative properties. All these things happen when you increase the concentration. Again, it does not matter what it is. It matters what the concentration is. Um, so here are four colligative properties. Okay, number one, this is what happens as you add more solute. So we're increasing concentration. As concentration goes up, vapor pressure in the solution decreases. A melting point decreases, boiling point increases, and osmosis is possible, which means, I don't know if you remember osmosis and not the cartoon. You go from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration. Freezing point makes more sense to you because what happens is the reason why the ice melts when you put salt on it is because you've lowered the freezing point. If the freezing point of water is at zero degrees C, if you lowered that point, then it's going to start melting because you're not at that temperature. It's going to start melting, which means it's going to get a little bit colder uh, really, really fast. That's one reason why ice cream freezes what it does. But I want to tell you this. Not one of these are happening at once. All four happen at once, okay? In other words, when you add salt to the ice, not only are you dropping the freezing point, you're also increasing the boiling point. You don't, don't notice it because you're not boiling it. The vapor pressure decreases and osmosis is possible. It's one reason kind of why it does kind of freeze. It does help out. So anyway, all these changes are called colligative properties. They depend on the number of solute particles, okay? In other words, concentration. You ever heard somebody say, put uh, salt in the boiling water, it'll help your food cook faster? Yeah. Okay, well, that's a colligative property. It increases your boiling point. Here's the thing. We measure energy by temperature, right? Mm -hmm. The higher the temperature, the more energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, for example, if you heat up a pan and you put your hand on it and burn it, the reason why you burn is because there's a lot of energy in there. And it's being released to your hand, therefore disrupting your membranes on your hand and burning you in the process. Uh, anyway. So, what is the boiling point of water? 100 degrees in, Celsius. In Celsius. Celsius, okay. 100 degrees Celsius. All right, and what is the freezing point of water? Zero degrees Celsius. That is a perfect range. That's why we use Celsius in science. 100 degrees. Okay? So, anywhere between this, it's liquid. Okay? If it goes below zero, it's ice. If it goes above, it's vapor. Okay? Gas, liquid, solid. Okay? Well, here's the thing. When you add salt in that water, it's like giving it a steroid. It does not, um, doesn't necessarily make it stronger, but it increases the range. And now I want y'all to understand, 
Uh, let's just say you've, I'm just doing a random number here. We'll figure out the numbers here later. Uh, it says right here the boiling point will increase. So if you put salt in water, all right, you're increasing the concentration, therefore increasing the boiling point. Let's say it goes up to 110 degrees Celsius. The reason why your food cooks faster is because now that water can hold above 100 degrees inside it. It takes longer to boil because there's more salt particles in the way, therefore it has more, have to have more energy to get up there. So it can hold it. The reason why it can't hold it at 100 degrees with no salt in it is because um, it's evaporating before it has a chance to stay as a liquid. Uh, this right here, when you add salt into it, keeps it in liquid form a little bit longer. Therefore it can hold more energy. So what happens is your boiling point will increase. But not only does the boiling point increase, but also your freezing point is going to decrease. Let's say if this increased by 10 degrees, let's just say, keep it even, uh, negative 10. Uh. So that's really cold. I don't know if you realize this, but if you notice when they say you put salt on ice and it feels colder and you can actually get frostbite, mm -hmm. uh, that's what happens. Uh -huh. You're dropping that freezing point. Um, Kind of what happens is a little bit of reaction. It's basically absorbing energy, which makes it melt, but therefore it also makes the surroundings really, really cold. That's how you make ice cream. Okay. Nice. Um, so, and I'll talk about this real quick uh, whenever, now nah, we'll talk about it here in a second. Uh, so I want you to realize most people think there's a shift when this happens. It's not a shift. It increases the range. So let's say you increase the concentration, like yeah, pure water, it's just gonna be zero to 100. But you sprinkle some salt in there, let's say, I don't know, half a cup of salt, okay? You've increased the concentration. Let's say it goes up to like, I don't know, three molar, all right? When that happens, you don't just drop down the freezing point and you just don't just increase the boiling point. You've done both at the same time. Like I'm telling you, all four of these happen at once. The ones that are most observable are the middle two, because of boiling point and freezing point. So that's why I say it's kind of like a steroid. It doesn't just uh, drop one and increase the other. You increase both the range of it. And the higher you make that concentration, the higher the range is going to happen. Okay? I just did you know 10 degrees here just to keep it you know straight. But anyway, actually we're going to now. There's a way that you guys can actually predict uh, based on the concentration how high the range is going to go. All right. I use salt a lot because that's what we mainly use for all this other kind of stuff, uh, for cooking and all that other kind of jazz. Anyway, all right, so we're going to talk about these main two of the four. Boiling point elevation, which means, think about the words here, boiling point elevation. What happens to the boiling point? It is if you, increased. If it elevates, then it's going to go up, okay? But anyway, the main thing is this, as you increase the concentration, the higher the boiling point will increase. And that goes for any compound. So what the example was kind of talk about down here was that water boils at 100 degrees C. I mean, would it be higher or lower if it's at six molar? Well, did you increase the concentration? Yeah. Therefore you increase the boiling point. Yeah. All right, now here's the thing, compare, are these two guys gonna have the same boiling point elevation? Nope. Yeah, they are, look at their concentration again. Colligative properties do not depend on the identity. It does not depend on uh, the kind of particles. In other words, it doesn't depend on identity. It depends on the concentration. Okay. Again, y'all wrote this down actually right here. So for example, three molar is gonna do the same effect as three molar of anything else. It depends on molarity, not on what it is, okay? So these two guys right here are gonna have the same boiling point elevation but is this going to be higher than both of these? Yes. Yeah, you increase the concentration. That's all you really, that's all that was really talked about. Basically, there's more salt particles in the way. Let's just use salt, for example. Therefore, it takes more energy to get it to that boiling point. So if you don't believe me, go home, boil a pot of water, sprinkle some salt in there. All of a sudden, the bubbles will stop. It'll still look like it's trying to boil, but it's going to slow down. But here's actually a picture going on. This is normal water. Pretend the, those are water molecules. Uh, and the red dots are the salt. Notice the energy kind of gets in the way, therefore it's a little bit tougher for the water to boil out. Freezing point depression, okay? Guess what? Uh, the answer's in the name. What happens to the freezing point as you increase the concentration? It depresses. If you're depressed, are you up or down? Down. Down, just like you are now. All right, so the freezing point of the substance is decreased when solute is added. It's basically opposite of the other guy. So by the way, freezing point of water is zero, it's gonna decrease. Are these two guys gonna have the same freezing point? Yes. 
Yes, the not all be, I mean all because these two guys have 0.5 molar solution, not because of the identity. But is this one molar going to be lower than these two guys? Yes. Yes. All right, so why is it harder for it to freeze? Well, same thing like it to boil. The particles are in the way. The ice particles, when they come together, they form a structure. You do know like how snowflakes form and all this kind of stuff is all based on water and how the water molecules all come together and make a different kind of shape. They say no two snowflakes are alike. But anyway, same thing. It's kind of hard for it to get into formation whenever there's salt in the way. It's like, hey, get out of my way. You know, I can't get into place. And so that's why it takes a little bit longer for it to freeze. However, the main thing to actually note is this. Here's a little bit of a quick rundown. Not just salt, but ethylene glycol, which we did say yesterday was? Methanol. Nope. Ethanol. It's in your car. Eth antifreeze. 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 Um, how antifreeze works is this, and my people think it just uh, keeps it from freezing. Okay. Antifreeze does lower the freezing point, and it, the name goes along with it, but if you look very closely at the label, it doesn't just say antifreeze. It also says... Engine coolant engine coolant. I'll come back to the other. Antifreeze and coolant. So what it really does is this. Yes, it drops the freezing point to keep the water in your engine from freezing, which is nice, which y'all haven't had to deal with yet. Uh, but also it increases your boiling point, which means if your engine gets hot, it keeps it cool because it doesn't boil at 100 degrees C. It boils at over like 120 or whatever it says on the label, depending on how much you got in there. Delta T. What does delta mean? Uh, Three. T means temperature. What does delta mean? Change. Change in temperature. So when you find this guy, you're finding the depression or the elevation. Okay, depending on what you're looking at, depends on what you're going to plug in here. If you're looking for boiling point, you're going to use a different kind of uh, K value. If you're going to use freezing point, you're going to use a different K value. And yes, I have to give you those two. Luckily for you guys, we're going to be doing only water. All right, so we did glycol, all that kind of stuff. We talked about those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, that's actually a good one. Uh, we didn't go over this one down here. Uh, why is this one going to end up being five? Well, is that a poly? Yeah. Do polys stay together? Yeah. So you don't count their number of particles. They separate into PO4, but three or two PO4s and three calciums. That's why the I ends up being five. That probably would be another one that they sometimes, but if you remember stuff back from unit four, you're good. All right, so let's take a look at how some of these guys will actually work. Um, now you see all these K values, it depends on if you're looking for freezing point or boiling point, okay? But let's just say we're looking for a freezing point depression. If we were using benzene, this would be the K value we would plug into K, okay? Um, we're going to mainly be using water, so I'm not really too worried about some of these other guys, so we're going to just keep it simple. So, all right, let's use this example here. All right, dissolve 62.1 uh, grams of glycol, in, which is one mole, okay, of glycol into uh, 250 grams of water, what is the boiling point of the solution, okay? So the K value, you're gonna always know that, but the K value will depend on if you're looking for boiling point or freezing point. So I have to give you both of those, okay? I'll give them both to you at the same time. I believe the KB, which is the constant for boiling point for water, is gonna be 0 0.52. So multiply all those together and you get your answer. What'd you get? Do, 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 do. And you're right. Now, here's the thing. This is boiling point elevation, okay? You're not done once you find that. I hate to break it to you. What you found was the change in temperature. So water boils at what uh, temperature? 2.8. No. <laughs> it's about to change, but normally it boils at what temperature? 100 degrees C. Well, since you just found out its elevation, you add that to the boiling point. And now you found out its new boiling point, which is degree C. That's going to be your final answer. You got to remember to add it to it. So here's the thing. If it's boiling point, like this guy, you're going to end up adding 100 to it, to your final answer. Okay? If it's freezing point, guess what? You're going to end up subtracting, well, zero, which really, honestly, whatever answer you get, just put a negative on. Mm. That's really what I kind of meant to say. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. All right. Anyway, so there you go. That's what that meant down there. Make sense? <coughs> You're about to do like tons of practice. Don't worry. Once you get it down, it's, 
Uh, it's a rhythm thing. Note this though, I will always give you the K. You will never have to find the K. We're always going to do water. We're not going to do anything else because that's just going to make things move a little bit smoother. Uh, the one thing you do got to note is your uh, find that molality. If you find molality and know how to find your I, you're good. All right, so freezing point depression. So let's say we were doing it now at this. Same thing, same experiment. Except, what's the one thing that's going to change? KF. The K. They say still use four molal, okay? So and we're still using the same stuff, which is going to have an integer one. The only thing you're changing here is uh, using this guy. Yeah, same thing. So you end up multiplying all those guys together. You're going to get a different number. Is it seven? Ooh, look at that. So 7.44, okay, which is really, what did I say? Subtract a zero, which in other words, just added negative to it. So in summary, going back to everything we talked about last week, we talked about what a solute is, the stuff that is being dissolved, the solvent, the stuff doing the dissolving. When you put them up together, you get the solution, okay? So in other words, is part plus part, when you add the two parts together, you get the whole, which is the total. So when you look at these, notice all these formulas still revolve around this, except one. Which one is the only one that is not part of a whole? The little m one. Um, mole fraction is. That has total right here. It's just different uh, units. Yeah. Okay. Solution. This one has solution. This one has solvent. All right. So looking at each one of these guys, where we kind of broke a lot of these down. Uh, obviously, you know, the volume that you're going to deal with is only going to happen in one of these values, okay, which is going to be molarity. So you notice he's the only one that has a volume in it. That's the only, re only thing you're going to use this for. However, this says liters, that says milliliters, so what are you going to have to do to it? Change, Change it. Change it. Which direction are you going to move your decimal, left or right? I hope you said left, because that's where you're going to do it. So really, if you move it three times to the left, one, two, three, you should get point. Oh, 0.05 liters. Yep. That is the only formula you're going to use this for. Yep. All right? I mean, don't get confused. I mean, all right, so moving on. They tell you that sucrose weighs this much. The molar mass is this. When added to the flask, the following mass measurements are recorded. You get this, you get that, you get this. They tell you all this kind of stuff that we talked about earlier. We already said what the mass of sugar is. Before the weighing boat was 30. After you dump it out, they weighed it again. It's going to be 6 grams when you subtract these two. So you're going to end up with six grams of sugar. I'm just going to call it sugar. Okay. We need to go ahead and also, well, let me ask you this. Is this your uh, solute, solvent, or solution? Solute. Solute. Okay. So this is our solute. We have that guy. That's what it's going to play as the part in this whole drama scene we got going on here. All right. So the next thing is this. You notice in some of these solutes, they're in moles. Only one of them that you're going to use as grams is in the percent by mass. Let's go ahead and plug that one in. So it's going to be times 100 gives you percent down her. Let's go ahead and put our six grams on top here because we're just plugging that in. All right, so here's the other problem. We say solute here, but they want these in moles of solute right up here. We got to go ahead and convert the sugar into moles. Well, we got our molar mass right here. So we take our six grams. Divide it by 340, uh, there I go again, derp, grams is one mole, multiply across the divide, you're going to get a decimal, what'd you get? Was there a zero, one, seven, five? One, eight, let's do one, seven, five. Okay, all right, so this is all your sugar, okay, let's go ahead and plug that in. Well, we know that we got our moles of sugar here. Screwed up, I can't see it. I keep doing that. I need it like a yeah. this light zero thing. Uh, <laughs> zero, one, seven, five moles. Right. We're going to use that in molarity. We're also going to use that in this guy. Oh. Too much shift. All right, let me go back. Uh, this one's molality. So we need that here too. All right, what else do we need it in? Well, let's take a look at mole fraction. Moles of X over moles total. Well, here's the thing. They want the mole fraction of sucrose, the mole fraction of water. The only difference between these two is the part is going to be sugar here, and the other part here in the under mole fraction of water is going to be water. So we'll need the mass of water eventually. But we're going to go ahead and use the mole 
of this guy right here, and which we found right here, over here too. So notice I repeated using that va same value like four times. Yeah, same number. Uh, which one of these can we go ahead and solve for? Yeah, let's go ahead and get it over with. So this divided by this, you get what? 0 0.36. 6? Yeah. Are you sure? 3.5. 3, 5. 3 5. I got 3. Yeah, something like that. All right. So you got 3, 5 here. We're done with A. All right, yeah, that's one less you got to deal with. Let's move on. So we did our sugar. We got it in moles. We can keep going on here. Some water is added to the flask. The solution is stirred. It's all dissolved. Yada, 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 yada. They waited again. Now, this is the mask of the filled volumetric flask. This is with the sugar, with the flask, with the water. All three are here. Okay? We need to break these jokers down. All right? So what else are we going to subtract here? Well, we got 199 grams. What is that going to give you the value of? The water. Solvent. I mean, the solvent. solvent, solute, or solution? Solution. The solution. solution. The solution. Here's the reason why, in case you missed that. And that's solution. Here's the reason why it's solution, because the mass of the flask was 145. Everything else in there is the sugar and the water together. So this value you get right here is the sugar and the water. Okay, so we do need this massive solution. Let's go ahead and plug that in. We need it right here, grams of solution. 54 grams. And eh, multiply it by, right there, you're going to get 11.11%. Now, you can put it in your calculator, but I know y'all know how to do percent. All right, uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's probably the only thing you need it for, um, sadly, because here's the thing. We now need the mass of water. Well, we got our mass of solution, we got our mass of sugar, okay, so we have a part, and we have our total, how do we find the solvent? Subtract 199 from 30, right? No. Other way around. You're done with this 199 and 145. I mean, it's you, you subtract the solute, which is 6 grams, from the solution, which is 54 grams. Yeah. Right. So you have this, which is 6 grams. You have this, which is 54. So basically, what plus that would give you 54? Well, subtract 6 from 40, 54. 48. 48 grams of sugar, water, or both? Just the solvent, which is water. So H2O. Now, here's the thing. Do we use just the mass of water on something? Well, not by itself. Um, we do, well, actually we do. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, we got the mass of water, which is good, because there is one formula that you do need the mass of water. It is uh, kilograms, which is molality. The molality one, which is right here. Well, we can't plug in 48 here, because that's in grams. Uh, go to, kilograms, so right. to the left. So that really is 0 0.048 kilograms. All right, well, you can divide that and get it out of the way. Should get point something. You probably got 37, 36, 365. Three, 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 yeah. three, All right. All right, so we're done with A, we're done with B. Excuse me. All right, so let's figure out what else we need to do. Oh, we're also done with E. My bad. How are we done with E? I already did the percent when we got the mass of it. Uh, okay, so now the mole fraction. All right. So here's the issue. We need moles total also. Okay, not mass total, but the mole total. And no, you cannot convert the 54 into moles right off the bat because it's a mixture of two different things. That's why we separate them. We got the mass of the sugar right here. Well, we got the moles of that already. We now need to convert this into moles itself. Yeah. All right. So you got to divide that there by 18.02. One mole. What'd you get? 2.66? Let's go with that. Seems legit. All right. So this is sugar. Again, I'm going to write down sugar. This right here is water, H2O. So now we can figure out all the rest we need to. The mole total is you adding these two guys together. 
So let's go ahead and add them together. What'd you get? Plus this right here, plus the other one. What'd you get? 2.678. Seems legit. And we're also going to use that same thing here. 2.678. Oops, I forgot the word mole. Okay. Now, we can figure out this guy, but let's do them both at the same time. What's going to be the guy that goes on top right here? Oh, the, it's going to be the part, isn't it? Another part. So, the, we, so it's going to be the moles okay. of water. So there was a lot of work to do all these. Now you can just put them in your calculator and get her done. You're going to get a decimal, a big decimal. I'm going to go ahead and put it in scientific notation for you, just because I can. So you probably got 0. .0006 something? No, wait, which one do you do? Uh, let's see. .00653. There you go. Um, I went and put scientific notation, and that's what happens when you do it in your calculator and say, put it in scientific notation. That's what it'll do. So uh, 5 times 10 to the negative 03. Right. Uh, and the other one you should have got 9 or 0 .0 or 0 .9, uh, 93. But I'm going to put it in scientific notation also. Will you have units for these two guys? Well, let's look. You divide moles over moles. Moles cancel out. Okay. So you're not going to have any units. Remember that. No units for mole fraction. It's just a decimal. Yes, Sometimes it's something else. But when you add these two guys together, you should get one. The number one. You should. Uh, probably won't, but okay. You'll probably get like nine, 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 nine. What? If you have like a thing without water, how do you know it's solute? A thing without water? Um, I will give it to you as water to make it simple. Or I'll come out and say the solvent is this. Because if it's not water, I have to come out and tell you if it's water or what your solvent is. I have to tell you. Other than that, you assume the larger guy is your solvent. The larger guy. That, the larger amount. Because let's be honest, if you take a look at the other amount here, you have 48 grams of water, 6 grams of sugar. That This is not going to dissolve that. The bigger guy is going to dissolve the smaller guy. Okay? It's just how it works. By the way, let me ask you a question. What? Do any of these answers repeat? No. no. Yes. The E does. The E does. Yeah, but you can put it percent. No. No, none of them repeat. Oh, you meant like, oh. Are any of these the same? No. Uh, so one thing I showed you is this. We use all uh, first four formulas on one problem. They're showing you they're all talking about concentration, but they're just different ways of expressing it. Uh, there's many ways that you can do it. The most popular is A. You're going to see us remember this. And some people were saying, well, how do I remember the difference between capital M and lowercase m? Well, the way I remembered it was this. Capital M because it's more important. That's how I remember it. You're going to use that more often on the test than anything else. It's this right here, molarity. These others you're going to see, but not as much as this. So 